Do not go anywhere. 60 Plus Racing Adventures is next. Keep it locked to Racebot TV and iRacing Live. For the third time this season, RaceBot TV and iRacing Live welcome you to Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin as the 60 plus racing adventures take their way around Road America for round number nine on this season. Good evening sim racing fans and welcome to tonight's show. My name is Cisco Scaramuza alongside Mr. Jake Sperry, Paul Smith, race director in the production truck as it were, twisting the dials, making sure he gets the picture you're seeing. And uh, well, Jake, third race on the season for us here, and it's at one of my personal favorites. I mean, it is also one of the closest tracks to me, but Road America, known for not only IndyCar running here in the past, as well as the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Lots of racing happens here, and this is a great circuit. Oh, it certainly was, and for anyone who watched Monday night, Skippy's on, well, you guessed it, the Monday night. We had a finish of three Skippy split by just 28 thousands of a second that's how close it was at the front there and this circuit certainly has all the tools available to it in the 6.44 kilometers 14 turns that it has available for it what a brilliant circuit it will be and with all these veterans looking to go at it as quickly as possible i expect some really really nice battling to go on here at cisco yeah, same here, Jake. And we're going to take a look at the driver standings right now. Jans van der Ven currently leads them with Bill Lawrence right behind. Now, keep in mind, this is only the third race we've been with this series. They've run three races in the interim since we last saw them at Laguna Seca. Previously, Bill Lawrence won that race at Laguna Seca. Antonio Reyes got the second race. And then Suzuka International that they ran the interim. Antonio Reyes got it done in the primary. Fiddler in the second. Donald Strout then went on a two-race winning streak in the primaries. Won the race at Montreal and won the race at Road Atlanta. And Antonio Reyes cleaned out the second races for both those as well. And we're back at Road America. Jonas van der Ven, though, very consistent on the standings. Has done a great job for that team. Keeping himself up at the top of Bill Lawrence, Andrew Fiddler, Stephen Karkner in your top four. Strout, Morgan, Robertson, Poole. Reyes and DePasqua, that's your top 10. And we'll talk a brief bit about the team standings. Team 1 currently leads it with Steve Karkner, Lawrence, and Robertson, and Andrew Morgan. And then DePasqua, Campodinico, and Reyes, that's team number 4. They're sitting second on that. But, Jake, this is a place where, as you mentioned, the draft can play a huge part in how to determine these races. We saw it in Monday Night Skippies. Are we going to see it tonight? I reckon we will here. It's not going to be as evident in the fact that we're going to be seeing the way they're battling, but what we are going to be seeing here is the draft being lingering, but still being very, very beneficial down the Keckle bottoms. You talk about the likes of the run towards turn number five. They're going to be so, so crucial to get here. I once looked at a uh, Pro Master race around here, and it was split here, Cisco. To the fifth decimal place that's what these vehicles can produce on drag races to life but as i'm looking at remigio de pasqua right now in the four he's got to get around a minute left on his lap as he now heads himself through the kink and now towards canada corner yeah uh this is kind of a mixture of there are kind of parts of european courses here of course in the fact that some of these turns are named some of them are not and a very hybrid circuit, very similar to stuff we see out of the FIA, as well as some American road course ideas put in as well. And 
we're watching on board, I believe, Reyes right now because he's still out on track. Sitting on top of the board at the moment, but he's still going out there trying to get every lap he can out of that number 007, Jake. And this is kind of one of those tricky parts with the arrow. We're going through the carousel right now. We're heading up towards the kink, which is probably the most infamous part of this track. But that carousel also does a lot to really figure in how the draft is going to work coming out of turn 10. It certainly is. He's not on a lap with just 10 seconds and under left in qualifying. I think Reyes has pole position here, Cisco. So why don't you take us through then how everyone stands? Absolutely. And as we going to head to the grid here, Antonio Reyes going to bring home that pole position there in the 007. Yas van der Ven going to be right behind him starting second. Third going to go to Steven Karkner. Fourth going to go to Andrew Fiddler. Fifth is going to go to John Unsby. And sixth going to go to John Morgan. Seventh position goes to Donald Strout, row four. We'll see Joe Wren and Mark Robertson together. Richard Coulomb in 10th position with Bruce Poole 11th. And it will be Paolo Bonacera who will round out row six. Jim Oliver, Remigio de Pasqua, Kenneth Dunmer, Franz Brink, Marcel Gutierrez, and Joe Martin. That'll round up through B18. And then the final positions, Gerard Florison with Wayne Galloway, Dave Killens, Ronald McManus and the two vehicles that failed to set a time today, uh, Jose Carlos Campon... Uh, oh, God, this is as bad as Arsidio Cono. Campodon Campodonico and also Paul Rosek, round out 24. Yep, and the rough, uh, the rough pace car out on track, so that means we will be taking a little bit of tour here at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, so we can break down this course for you guys here. Maybe do a little bit of onboard shot so you guys can see what the drivers are going to be seeing once they hit the tarmac. But just want to remind everyone, thank you very much to uh, be here. Makes what we do possible. There, had, I had to find the plug there. Want to thank our sponsors and to Design, of course, on the ticker as well as Appgeneer.in for making everything happen behind the scenes on the overlays today. And of course, Paul Smith. Once again, we'll give him one more, one more hello because he doesn't get enough of it. Yeah, and a lot of sponsors here that have done a very good job over helping us with Racebot TV and the likes and doing a very good job here. Of course, we've got Paul behind the scenes uh, on the cameras doing a fantastic job as per usual. But what you're going to find here is that these circuit runs in towards corners like turn number one, they're going to be very, very crucial here, especially in the opening lap where you're going to be too wide side by side. And then you've got this small kink of two coming up, Cisco. Not really a corner, but it's the run out of three that becomes very, very important here today. And it's a little important because you really have to set up how you deal with two is how you're going to apex into three. And this one, the first, the second time we've seen rumble strips, you have them on the outside as well. Then you have the long straightaway down to the moraine sweep before you hit the heartbreaking turn five. A lot of runoff there. And that most notably is the place where we see a lot of in incidents in the Verizon IndyCar series because of how the downforce works on these cars. A very high downforce corner. You're going to be hard on the brakes. And if you miss your breaking point, you're going straight off either into the pavement runoff or even worse, into the gravel. Yes, and turn number five certainly does have that potential to make that happen. But what people don't give credit for is just how drastic the undulation change can be at Road America. When they get through five and come out of five, it's a massive uphill towards turn number six. If you haven't sorted your move out already, well, here is the opportunity that you get it a big up the hill that you look for under that Corvette footbridge and then you head yourself through the 90 degree left hander a lot of nice degree corners in this middle section of the lap because as you head through this next section turn number seven on circuit you got yourself the hurry downs yeah and then down the hill you're gonna go and start getting ready for dealing with that carousel at turns nine and ten and you can see Antonio Reyes kind of warming up the tires a little bit on that 007 Jos van der Ven just happily cruising for the moment behind the pace car now you got this it's really another 90 degree corner which is odd the way this course is set up but it sets you up to go right under that Johnsonville bridge and then into the carousel and here this is all about throttle modulating because you have to make sure you're carrying some sort of speed but you don't want to apex out too far or too early or else you're going to end up in the grass and you're not going to have a fun time we have seen too wide through there in the past it's hard to maintain though as they head out of turn 10 towards the notorious kink yeah the kink can catch any driver out on any given day at all and that kink 
is uh, about trying to run it as flat out as possible with the downforce here on these vehicles. I wouldn't be surprised to see flat out going through here as now you head yourself through the kettle bottoms and the run towards Canada Corner. A prime overtaking opportunity here today, Cisco, with the fact that it's 90 degrees. It's very inviting as a corner to stick your nose down the inside and we will see quite a few moves going on here as they look to have two corners to go after that before they line up and take the 14 lap race. Yep, Canada corner up next, corner number 12 on the circuit, then you have a sweeper in 13, and then another kind of decently hard turn number 14 before it takes it back up the hill towards the start-finish line. Weather today? Well, it's a uh, mostly cloudy 78 degrees Fahrenheit, track temps at 89 degrees, not a whole lot of wind out there, and the uh, road humidity at 55%. For those of you familiar with the service, I think you'll know what that means. We're on default weather here, and that means for these guys, plenty of practice time, decent grip levels, but for these guys, as they make the final corner, this is what they have to deal with. The long straightaway up towards the start finish line. It's delayed, so you want to make sure if you're going to make that pass at the line, you wait until the right moment. We thank you for joining us here on Race Spot TV. Green flag is in the air. And under the Caterpillar Bridge, they go on the loud pedal, and they head away towards turn number one. Well, it's a very good start there from Antonio Reyes. He's got the car length advantage over Van der Ven. Karkner will look to try and follow in the tow, but thinks better of it, of going side by side in towards turn number one. But very good. They are going to be all through this opening section. No real dramas from any of the drivers in the opening corner. So that's very, very nice to see. Reyes then at the front will have Van der Ven now to follow on this very, very difficult run towards turn number five. It's time for the slipstream train to get into action. And this is where if you jump to the inside of someone, you have to make sure your braking liner is down or else turn five is going to be a disaster. Up to the driver's left goes Jas van der Ven down into turn five. He's going to break extremely hard and he's going to make it work on the apex. Pass for the lead. Jas van der Ven gets it done. And right behind him, Karkner, right on the gearbox here as they head under the bridge into five and then as well into seven here as well. Hurrying up towards those hurry downs. Yes, they are hurrying up towards the hurry downs, but I was just noticing there that Karkner was a little bit tentative in the way that he backed out of it compared to Reyes and Van der Ven heading through turn number five. He had a good run, but decided to back off the throttle, lost himself about four tenths of a second. And because of that, throughout this entire second half of this lap, he has been unable to close up to the back of Antonio Reyes. And it's been very, very difficult. We've got a few packs starting to form here. We've got the pack going on here for what is going to be P number six, John Morgan. We're the likes of Mark Robson and Bruce Poole all in there in this little scrap. And this mid-pack scrap is going to be very, very important for points. Side by side for the lead, though. Van der Ven here applying the pressure here on the driver Antonio Reyes. Reyes, though, back through and forces the point. Reyes seems to be really good on those offline corner passes. He got it done going into five last time, and Karkner going to get a little bit of the grass there. He was trying to make it work against Van der Ven. Didn't work. But Karkner seems he's a little bit loose. Meanwhile, Reyes, who's Really just been able to make it work, even if he's not online, Jake, he's been able to get the break so far perfectly and be, been able to get those passes done. Yeah, he certainly has, and getting those passes done around this circuit is what is crucial for fourth position, though. Fiddler will look at position number three, third, looking at second as well as Karkner tries to go through on Van der Ven. That's not going to happen. The door is shut very firmly by Karkner. No way for Andrew Fiddler to find a way through, but all this has done is close the train up. Unsby on the back, Strout on the back, Morgan on the back. We've now got an eight, nine, ten car train going on all the way back to Joe Wren in the 006 now for this leading battle, and if anything cares to be shown it means that you've got to be in track position if you want a shot at victory 14 laps is not very long at all battle for third still though fiddler may have a chance down to the inside he thinks better of it yeah caught a little bit of dirt up there but karkner gonna drop in back behind so everybody single file for the moment i'm wondering i think at this point these guys gonna cruise for a couple laps see They'll probably make those moves when the arrow goes their way, Jake. We're already seeing the aerodynamics starting to play towards actually the help of Antonio Reyes has a huge lead at the moment. Everyone else kind of stuck in that pack and they're kind of stuck in that dirty air so they can't really get too far out in front. They can't fall too far behind. It's almost like a plate track out there. 
at the moment it is. It's very, very different to the likes of, say, Lagoon Seiko, which we last saw here in Racebook TV, where the gaps were very, very pronounced very, very early on, and it was very difficult to find which drivers had the advantage and which drivers didn't. But here, it's going to be a case of what can you do? Fiddler versus Unsby, though, for P4, P4. Five right now, Unsby being a little bit uh, blocked there in the middle of the circuit. There was no real way to make a way, a way around Fiddler. Fiddler, very good car placement there he had, and he manages to hold that position on the run into Canada Corner. Bill Mitchell then turn 13, holding that line very nicely, but now that's just allowed the top three to give themselves a little bit more breathing room right now as Kartner looks to chase Van der Ven. Van der Ven to Reyes. Reyes will be very happy to be defending this from the front. Up the hill, though, that's where the draft is so much more effective. Yeah, and Reyes did not have a good Canada corner last time by, and it's going to allow Jas van der Ven. He was able to close, but he's going to sit behind. So van der Ven thinking, no, this isn't the time I want to do this. I think he's starting to bind his time a little bit in that 167, waiting to see when he can make that move. As for Steven Gardner, he's looking a little bit to driver's right. Let's see what happens as they head towards the Sargento Bridge, and Gardner going to look to see when he can make that move. He's going to have more draft on that Jans van der Ven machine than van der Ven's gonna have on Reyes. And yep, Karkner's gonna try and make it work and a look to driver's left as they head into turn five. And that's a little bit of strategy which has gone against Jos van der Ven because he had the opportunity to make that move into turn and was behind that as Karkner goes through. It's going to be John Unsby making the way through on Andrew Fiddler. Fiddler trying to hold the advantage, but he's going to have to back out of it as the squeeze is applied. Almost a cast width and under being given there to Fiddler. Fiddler had nowhere to go, but that's the thing. Van der Ven could have had the lead into turn and one. Instead, he's now into position number three through the hurry downs as now it seems that Karkner is really getting himself quite busy because he is all over the rear of Antonio Reyes. Something to note here, Bill Lawrence, second place in the point standings, not here in this race, Jake. And that means for Andrew Fiddler, for Steven Karkner, those guys sitting right behind him. Fiddler and Karkner are tied at 81 points, so whoever's ahead of the other here is going to have that second place points position, be able to go after Jas van der Ven. Meanwhile, battle van der Ven himself trying to grab that position away from Karkner. So not only is it a battle on the track, it's a battle for that championship, cha championship standing. It certainly is, and with uh, Fiddler going backwards in position number five, you feel that it's advantage Karkner wherever he is at the moment, but he's not thinking about that championship right now. He's thinking about getting a victory out of the final corner, then start lap four out of 14, and around halfway through lap four, we will be one quarter's distance, or in fact, one third's distance here through this event. And now Van der Ven getting a massive, massive run up the hill, has the potential to maybe look down to the inside. They're all chasing it down, though, and that means there's no fuel saving going on from any of these drivers. Karkner late down to the inside. Big power move. And thank you very much. He takes the race lead. But you know what? He's left himself a little bit short because Reyes could have a go back into turn number three. He thinks better of it. Maybe to five. I think the problem is Reyes could have had the cut back, but Karkner did enough job of blocking that that short, short shoot into three. Doesn't give you a lot of time to do it. Now Reyes going to go back for the cut back. Going to look to drivers right as they head into turn five. They're going to go side by side. Huge hole of air then for Jas van der Ven. He can just basically pull up to the side of these guys. Side by side they go. And van der Ven actually under attack as those two go single file in front. Now it's van der Ven under attack. John Unsby looks to drivers left. He'll head preferred line under the Corvette bridge. Yeah, and that was Van der Ven having to back off and didn't leave. Well, he left the door half a jar. And as we know, if you leave a door half a jar, it means that there's opportunity for the driver to come down in. And for John Unsby, he takes position number three. And Van der Ven only going backwards now. And it seems that Van der Ven will be frustrated. He feels that he is a quicker driver. Look at how that battle only through one corner has completely changed the complexity of this battle at the front. Reyes and Karkner now have about four, five, six tenths of a second advantage now over drivers like Unsby and Van der Ven. Van der Ven, great run through the kink, flat out, almost, as he now gets tucked in right underneath, looking for a way through, looks to the left, maybe that's going to work. No, it doesn't. The offensive line taken, and again here, Cisco, we're looking at jo uh, Jos Van der Ven, feeling like he's there, but he's just getting the wrong rub of the greens. Yeah, I, he has the speed. I think he's being very conservative right now, and if you look at the standings, he really doesn't need to push the issue here, Jake. He can afford to kind of sit behind, let the race run its course, save his tires. If he wants to make a move towards the end of this thing, is they're going to battle for the lead. 
Reyes once again trying to get the cut back on Gartner. Those two have been battling all day. Reyes going to make it happen. It looks like he's going to have it. Got to watch out, though. Gartner probably going to try and get the cut back here as they head through turn number one. But I have to think for us, Vanderven, the gameplay is simple for him. Just make sure you don't tear up the car and get those championship points. Yes, the championship points are so vital. There's no point throwing away the race, going for second position or any other position for that matter. A fact where you can conserve your points and get yourself forward. The Alain Prost effect is now. Van der Ven will look to come back at John Unsby for the final spot on the podium. But in front of that, side by side, too wide, too deep as Karkner comes back into turn number five. Easy move for Karkner going through, but Van der Ven not having it his own way. And now the door half opens. He tries to go defensive here with Fiddler trying to go down to the inside and he will go down to the inside but he's stuck on the inside and van der ven holds on but at the expense of about seven tenths of a second yeah van der ven lost a ton of time right there jake and it basically stacked everyone else up you got donald strump making his way into this picture oh yeah 53 problems for franz brink their car off track facing the wrong way also got a car kind of spinning through turn five but we'll get a look at the replay and that was problems with the 53 and the 22. 22 got forced off track, tried to make his way back on track. And well, the 53 shut the door on him. Jake, he didn't want him coming back on track. And well, that's that's what happens. Well, he's entitled to do that though, Cisco. That's the thing. If the vehicle's all four wheels off the circuit, it might as well be considered as not being there. So in, in real uh, racing terms, shall you say, a car that's off the circuit, not have to let back on in my opinion Oliver should have been a little should have had a little bit more foresight and backed off a little bit more to allow himself a chance to get back on but again at the front of the field Reyes gets a good run out of the final quarter instant defensive line then from Gartner who almost overcompensated and got wheels on the grass side by side over the line the difference 69 thousandths of a second doesn't matter it's not the final lap of the race side by side though it will be the outside line though that Reyes will have to do and into to turn number one, hung out to dry. Van der Ven also on the defense right now. Fiddler runs wide. And that's Karkner taking the IndyCar strategy of breaking that slipstream, Jake. You saw if Reyes had been behind Karkner, he would have been able to grab that position, but Karkner broke that draft, and you can see him starting to weave around a little bit. It's going to start looking like the Indy 500 out there because that's what these guys have to do to break that slipstream, stop those passing attempts from happening, but that time, Karkner let it happen, and Reyes now going to look for the undercut into Term 5. Deep goes, and not going to work. Karkner had to go on the defensive there because Unsby was right on the back bumper and was able to make it work. Gearbox, I should oh. say. Van and, wow, Van der Ven. Yeah, exactly. that was not good. That was almost mistimed. Yes, and he had to just jam on the brakes there up the hill. Thought he had enough room, but into that braking zone, there's no lights or anything on the back of these pro All oh, around goes around. Karkner. Yes, Karkner going around now, and it's caused a chain reaction. Another vehicle has spun as well in all red everything. That's Morgan as well. Replay on screen, and that was a very, very scary moment, Cisco. And that all started with Stephen Karkner, who had just lost that first place position to Reyes. He comes through into the into the uh, hurry downs here, and I'm not sure if he just missed his braking point. Yeah, I Pro think that's it. all it was. I, I think... break the corner, and the car just got loose. And next thing you know, it looks like Andrew Fiddler's got damaged because he hit the wall. Got oh, actually, he had a little bit of wing damage. It looks like maybe a little bit of a punt from behind, but it just got real sketchy right there, really quickly. Yeah, it certainly did. And look who it has benefited. Antonio Reyes now with a commanding lead over John Unsby, who's now got to battle every man and his neighbor here in this train. Now Mark Robertson, who was eighth at the start of this lap, is now looking for position number two overall as they go side by side as they cross the start finish line. Gap across the line between the leaders is now three and a half seconds. Oh, Van that's Ven not going to work. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Van der Ven boxing himself there on the outside. That is not the most brilliant way to go through. Robertson stuck on the outside. Van der Ven says thank you very much. Uh, he made it work, but that's not some place I'd want to put my cars. He's going to get a slight tap from Robertson there. Just ever so slightly on the gearbox. No, no harm, no foul, but Jans van der Ven made it work. It was able to get the freight train 
on that on that car there and as they head towards turn five now the question is is van der ven gonna look for more gonna look to driver's right yes he is he's gonna be on the outside apex here will he make it work no deep breaking by the 61 don't touch guys and unspeed gets a little bit of a wiggle side by side as they head under the bridge oh. Yes, we got a car turn around behind that. That's Bruce Poole, who was very, very unlucky because he was side by side coming out of the corner with Donald Strout. Little bit of contact, and then he had two bits of more contact on the exit there. It was just a case of once one thing happens, the domino effect came into play for Poole. Yeah, and it looks like Poole almost took his hand off the wheel there for a moment because he drifted right into the 18. He could have corrected and got that car back on, but I'm not really sure what happened with the 57. He's going to have to tow that car back to pit road, so more problems for that team. They have not had a good week, or they have not had a good month and a half on, uh, on Race Fun TV, that's for sure. And uh, they'll be looking to repair that car and maybe go after it in race number two. But battle between John Unsby and Jas van der Ven, those two going at it. If you want to know where Antonio Reyes is, he's way in front of these guys. So that battle for that second position. Yeah, he certainly is. Van der Ven through then at Canada Corner, making that one look very, very comfortable. But John Unsby will not be happy with third position. He'll want to get back to second. Donald Strapp, who started second today, now looking to, well, seventh today even, shall I say, is now looking at position number four with a little bit of opportunity right now. Maybe down to the inside. In fact, it's for position number three, the final spot on the podium. And now Strout looking at Unsby. Can he be the last of the late breakers? Jean Alessi, yes. Nope. He decides to back out of it. There's a better opportunity later down the road. Not the best run, though, from Unsby. He tries to play the defense, but he's left it too little too late. Down to the inside of three. Thank you very much. Donald Strout, the Donald up into P3. Yeah, and he's making his way through this field, and this is kind of the MO of the driver of the eight. He always waits till a little bit later and starts to make his move single. Nice, plenty of time. Doesn't have to rush it too often, and right now the eight doing an excellent job, but John Unsby will not be denied. Into turn number five goes the bright yellow number 61. Contact, and they'll make it work, but Strout is not going to be happy after that, and that's going to allow Fiddler to get himself right back into this equation. You see a little bit of rear wing damage on that 18, but apart from that, car looks pretty stout. You've got to be very, very careful with contact like that because the suspension is fragile on these Pro Masters. Just make sure that you hold the vehicle together. There may be a little bit of a slant on Donald Strout's machine if he is not careful. And well, now you've got to make sure that everything gets itself into play. Fiddler is all shapes of wrong through the carousel. He will put himself now under a lot of pressure from the driver of Donald Strout behind. And now Strout will look to try and make that move. Robertson waiting as well in the wings. But Reyes now brings the gap over five seconds. Here comes Donald Strout though, here down the kettle bottom, looking for Canada corner to the outside. He will try and go, but to the inside, he won't be able to sling that Pro Master in. He waits behind. Yeah, and Stroud at this point looks like he can just wait behind Fiddler to make the right move because Fiddler's wing damage doesn't look like it's helping that car very much. And I think for Stroud, he just has to make his way around that car, find a good straightaway where he can get a draft, and that'll be job done because the 18 was able to catch up to that battle because of the contact, but apart from that, I just don't think the 18 has the top end. Oh, someone, uh, we got a yeah, car seven, off somewhere. 78, that's Ronald McManus, I do believe, who's gone off, and it's at Canada Corner as well. He was going side by side with the driver of Kenneth Dummer. There was contact between the pair of them, and, well, it just seemed to me that contact was just enough to send McManus all shades of off and a little bit more, maybe a little bit of damage there as he just hit the brakes and decided, I need to get off the racing line. Yeah, he hit the brakes there, so something definitely wrong on the McManus card. He's going to pull it onto the pit straight here, and it's slowing way down. So he's got some major damage on that 78, so he's pulling it behind the wall here. Meanwhile, you bet your uh, lead gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Actually, no, it fell a little bit. Now it's Van Der Ven. It was at five seconds before. It's now at 4.9. So, I mean, ever so slightly, but also you have to think the undulation of this course probably messing with the times a little bit here. Vanderven may be a little bit better in kind of the middle portion of this track, but Reyes killing it there on the beginning and ends of it. Certainly is. The battle for P4 is what I'm looking at here. Uh, Fiddler versus Strout at the moment. And just looking at Strout's vehicle right now, a lot of damage on that front wing. That's going to be really affecting him 
to these really, really fast corners. And the fact that there is that damage on that front wing is really going to be hurting him later on in this. But the issue that he's got and the advantage he's got is the fact that the rear wing's hurting on Fiddler. So his top speed's down, whereas you look at Donald Strout's cornering to be a little bit further down as well. They look to try and close that gap up a little bit more. Strout looking for the inside, but again, backs out of it there because he wasn't a car width alongside. And that's been his issue, his big issue all this time since he's had that front wing damage. Yeah, and Strout looking to try and get past. Meanwhile, battle for P number 11. It's Carter. He's back after that spin out, and he's going after. And wow, that's going to get real close right there with Remigio de Pasqua. It looks very similar to Antonio Reyes's car. This Karkner is going to go way off, almost went in the go-kart course there. He's going to lose two spots to Bonacera and de Pasqua. Two teammates getting past him. The car is very similar to Antonio Reyes, so it did not work there for Karkner. And uh, he made, I think, what I'd like to call an off-track excursion there, Jake. Yes, I think you have to say that was a big off-track excursion. And unlike a go-kart, it is very much more difficult to make the overtake in front of Karkner now. Bonacera going side-by-side -side with De Pasqua. And De Pasqua's not been sensational here today. He's just been very, very consistent and gaining those four positions off of the misfortune of others. He knows here just what he needs to do. And Bonacera instantly gives up the position compared to Karkner right now as Karkner gets a stunning run through turn number three and will now look to take position number 10 away and we'll edit that bonus here running the same paint scheme as the number four of um of de pasqua but those two looking at everything here yeah those two not teammates de pasqua is teammates with reyes though so right now a good showing for team number four we'll keep an eye on that here as the race begins to wind down team points looking very good right now for that team number four and the 07 problems looks like for that car trying to figure out what happened we might get a replay look at it. Oh, he's just running slow. So could yeah, that have been, could that have been the oh, blown engine, I believe, that we're looking at here, Cisco. And he goes himself through turn one. Bang! And yes, the engine's gone. Kenneth Dummer struggling after his contact with McManus. He's gone. But keep an eye on P2 now because Joss van der Ven lost that position on this lap. Needs to get it back. Four-way scrap for the podium. And oh, Strout had to get very, very late on the brakes there. And a contact moment there with the driver of, I believe, John Unsby. He's now bumped to the back of the train. Yeah, Unsby kind of fell back there a little bit. So it's back to single file for a moment and do want to touch looks like problems for Karkner. Oh my gosh, he's flipped that car over. We'll take a look at what happened there, but massive problems for the 75. A bad day goes oh worse, my word. and it's a battle between Remigio de Pasqua here as we're getting a look at it. It was through the kink, Jake, and Karkner just missed. He just missed the corner. Yeah, Bonasara also gone. Going through the kink too wide is never a good idea. Karkner was out, and then he spearhead straight across, and there was no contact, actually, between Karkner and Bonacera. Bonacera into the wall in avoidance. That's a heavy, heavy contact, and Stephen Karkner then loses out, and a very crucial amount of points that he will lose in the process. So we'll flash back up to P2, and do want to note the Kenneth Doomer thing looks like what happened, Jake, very similar to the Michael Conti problem we saw in the NASCAR peak and free series the double downshift struck again so for that car blown motor game over for those guys plus Steven Gartner all those guys will have to make it work in race number two if they hope to get themselves some championship points meanwhile that battle for P2 continues and it's Donald Strout looking to see where he can get by as they head to the hurry downs Yes, and well, Donald Strout was very, very aggressive on the brakes last lap. He needs to find a way past Van der Ven, but of course, got to remember the front wing damage is always going to be against Donald Strout. Fiddler waiting in the wings. You can see instantly the wider line taken by Donald Strout. Because of the fact that he's got that damage, he will take that wider line because of the fact that those vortexes and the dirty air effect becomes that much more pronounced when the air is flowing over Van der Ven's vehicle. Now, through this right-hander of the kink, not going too wide as was demonstrated just one lap ago. And with three laps to go when they cross the line, Strout may be biding his time. He had a good opportunity there to just close in if he was in the toe all the way, but he wasn't, so he'll still Stay behind. You'll have better opportunities though later on. Got to be careful though. Fiddler is behind. Yeah, Fiddler is behind. And meanwhile, Antonio Reyes opening up that gap. It's 6.2 now as they're getting close to the line. Three laps to go for Antonio Reyes. He's in cruise control at this point, Jake. Doesn't even have to worry about it. 
It's going to be between Donald Trout and Andrew Fiddler and Jas van der Ven for those podium positions. John Unsby a little further back. He's going to need some help if he hopes to get back up there. Yeah, he will need a little bit of help, will John Unsby right now. is actually battle going on for P3. Fiddler may look down to the inside of Strout. No, Strout was using the toe every last inch of it there in towards turn number one. So Fiddler was left going for a position which didn't really exist anymore. Now through turn number three, and he's lost so much time because of it. Now Strout with a good opportunity on the back of Van der Ven, but Van der Ven just holding station in second position. Can't catch down Antonio Reyes. He's now got to focus primarily on defending and that's a very very difficult skill to have with this rear view mirror driving only from here to the end for van der ven yep van der ven's got to make sure he holds those defensive lines jake because those very important here this is a very apex driven circuit it's very hard to make it work when you're not on the apex the only place you can really do that is going to be in the carousel everywhere else you're going to want to be on that apex so defensive lines as you said going to be paramount to hold that second place position and you got the train starting to form you got Fiddler behind Strout behind and Unsby getting closer and closer so based on that I have to say Jas van der Ven not the fastest car in this group here part of that comes down to the slipstream though Part of it does come down to the slipstream and the fact that he will not have any benefit of toe in front of him compared to all those drives behind us. Now Unsby joins the group, maybe Richard Coulomb, if he's lucky, gets into the group with a few laps to go. Remember though, uh, in Monday night skippies just a couple of nights ago, it was a three second gap for the leading two and that became nothing because drivers were playing chicken. My oh, game is actually off. Yes, that is Donald Strout losing it there. That damage becoming very prevalent through Canada corner. He gets himself through the corner there, Cisco, too much onto the curb, and that vehicle was never coming back around. Now that the curb struck again, so for Strout, that's game over, and that hands the third spot on the podium to Andrew Fiddler, and that's a huge hit in the points for Donald Strout, who needed a good run today. He was sitting fifth, he was one point off of Fiddler and Karkner, and now based off this, the fact Karkner's already crashed, as has Strout, Fiddler's basically locked himself that second spot in the driver's standings. Yeah, and back for P6 side by side. Ren now looking to go through on Robertson. Robertson has only been going backwards here for the majority of this event. And now the position is Joe Ren's there in the 006. John Morgan will look to try and make a way through as well. For the time being, he'll stay at the back of this three-car train. Good run out of the exit, though, for John Morgan here. He will look to close down Robertson, but uh, by the same volition, Joe Ren will be closed down as well. But heading further forward, oh, that's not looking good. at it. No, and Fiddler just not able, uh, well, Unsby not able to get it through, but down to the inside, Robertson makes that one look very comfortable. Yeah, that got real sketchy right there because they almost went three wide, and I can tell you for a fact, three wide into turn five does not work at Road America. We've seen that in Verizon before. We probably would have seen the same thing. Luckily, these guys got back two file and single file, and they made it work through the corner. However, John Morgan did lose a lot of time because of that. Ooh, As a result, cool starting to fall back. Oh, Coulomb's around. Yep, and uh, the conversion went wrong for him, and it was it was right before the carousel that was there. So turn eight, that left hander is what caught him out. Yeah, too much curb on the exit, but he was looping it around before that oversteer. Talk oversteer, sometimes you could call that one. Coulomb just very, very unlucky there to lose that. He loses three positions in that process, and any hopes for a podium are dashed side by side, though. Unsby down to the inside of Fiddler, but no, not going to have that. The door is very firmly shut there, an ironclad door. Yeah, and John Unsby... He went purple last time by the stripe, so Unsby setting the fastest lap in the race, the best time at 2.2 2, 2 minutes, 3 seconds flat. So Unsby's got speed, he just needs to make it work. Andrew Fiddler still defending with that aero damage, maybe not the fastest car in the 18, but we're running out of time because the white flag's in the air. White flags in the air, one final lap to go then, and Antonio Reyes has the ability to close that gap down and say, you know, close up shop side by side though into one, Unsby versus Fiddler, Fiddler holding it on the outside with the damage, Unsby a very clean vehicle now, looking at turn number three, think he's got the advantage, or oh, they almost come together a second time, but they hold it all together side by side, and Fiddler will need to just duck back into the toe to gain that boost again, but it's the fact that they were side by side out of the corner, which gives it advantage Unsby right now here, Cisco. I'm not sure if Fiddler knew if he was clear or not. He's going to get shoved to the outside of the racetrack by John Unsby. Into five, they go deep breaking there for Fiddler. 
not gonna lock it up a little bit. The 61 Unspee making it work, comes back on track. They're still side by side. Fiddler dive bomb, no, he's gonna get out of it a little bit. And Joe Wren's around there. Joe Wren turned around on the final court, on the final lap. Goes down to the inside of Robertson, all over the curb. Gets too greedy on the power. Around he goes, small tap with the barriers. Meanwhile, bad battle for second. John Unsby right now in control. Andrew Fiddler looking for any way he can find past that car. That's actually the battle for third because Jas van der Ven out to the races in front of those guys. Fiddler got loose through the carousel. That's not going to help. He's running out of time. He certainly is, and with just a few corners to go and just this section of track, I think with Fiddler's damage, it's going to be all she wrote. But what about Antonio Reyes in the 007? It's been victory personified right now here, Cisco. Yep, through Canada quarter, no problems for the 007. Going to head through 13 and one more corner before Antonio Reyes can put the steering wheel away. Final time through turn number 14 for Antonio Reyes. It's one hill away from another victory here in the 60 plus racing adventures. Up the hill he goes nice and easy. The 007's gonna bring it home. Checkered flag in the air. Antonio Reyes is a winner once again in the 60 plus racing adventures. And right behind him, Yas van der Ven. Gonna bring it home second. Unsby, fantastic battle with Fiddler. Nabs that last spot on the podium. Yeah, brilliant battles, and now John Morgan trying to make it late. He's going to run out of time, though, against Andrew Robertson. So oh, and runs off and again. Runs again. Yeah, ran off again, and that's heavy, heavy damage on him because he gets wide out of the final quarter, and he's just on the gravel. Those big, big bumps there with the gravel deposited one way, then the other. Uh, Joe Wren turned around, and that is going to be him behind the Pasqua as well. What a horrible last lap for Joe Wren. Yeah, Joe Wren dropped a ton of places there that time by. Not at all what he was looking for, but a couple more guys still having to cross the line here. The battles, for the most part, have sorted themselves out. Just guys kind of cooling down through their cooldown laps, and uh, I think there might be some donuts for that 007. No, he's already pulled into victory lane, so we'll speak to him in a little bit here, but let's run you through our full race results here for race number one tonight for the 60 Plus Racing Adventures at Road America. Antonio Reyes brings home the victory there in the 007. Yas van der Ven finishes second. John Unsby finishes third. Those three you will not see in race number two. They move on. They're done for the night because they finished on that podium. Andrew Fiddler finishes fourth. Mark Robertson fifth. John Morgan sixth. Seventh going to go to Richard Coulomb. Eighth going to go to Gerard Florissant. Ninth going to go to Remigio de Pasqua. And Joe Wren rounds out your top ten. Marcel Gutierrez finishes position number 11 in the 678 machine. Joel Martin will finish home in 12th with Dave Killens. Started 21st plus 8 for his day up into position number 13. Franz Brink, Brink P14 after a scary day. Wayne Galloway P15, Jim Oliver, Paolo Bonacera and Jose Carlos. Campodonico, uh, the drivers who finish on the leading lap. Kenneth Dummer will finish P19. Rounding out the top 20, though, a disappointing day for Donald Strout. Yeah, not at all what he wants, and we might get a chance to talk to him later on. We'll have to see. Ronald McManus, Stephen Karkner, who car cartwheeled his way into the second race. Not at all what he wanted there, but he's going to be able to make it up in the second race. Bruce Poole, bad luck gets worse for that 57 team, and Paul Rozek, final car on that grid but like we're gonna take them over we're gonna step aside queue up race number two see if we can get those guys sorted switch on over for race number two you're watching the 60 plus racing adventures right here on the race spot tv and i racing live hey keep it locked we're not going anywhere I sat in the car, you, know, you always wonder, what's it gonna feel like? You know, it was my first time driving a mid-engine GT car. You know, my thoughts were, wow, this is really good for a first time in a car. I was really surprised by it. You're sitting low, you got the A-pillars at steep angles, the windshields at steep angles, you can see the fender flares. I think we have a chance to win. Everything's gotta go right, but I think we have a car that can win the race or be on the podium but can you imagine how cool that would be to, to go back 50 years later to the year and, and, uh, and do it?
Introducing a whole new form of racing to the best online racing simulation in the world. This is Dirt Racing on iRacing.com. Race online at some of America's most legendary dirt tracks, including Eldora and Williams Grove. iRacing is the premier online racing game featuring NASCAR, IndyCar, sports cars, and now World of Outlaws, the leading sanctioning body for dirt racing iRacing is easy to use and features a centralized ranking system to make sure you have the best experience at any skill level. With a massive inventory of high precision laser scan tracks and cars with an unmatched dedication to quality and detail, iRacing gives you the most authentic online racing experience available. Thanks to iRacing's dynamic track system developed specifically for dirt racing, tracks change over the course of a race, just like your favorite dirt track on a Friday or Saturday night. From a slick racing group all the way up to the cushion, iRacing's dirt tracks deliver non-stop racing action. Partnered with the World of Outlaws, iRacing is your source for the most authentic dirt racing experience available, featuring four brand new tracks and 11 new cars, including street stocks, Legends cars, late models, NASCAR trucks, winged and non-winged sprint cars, with much more on the way. Join the dirt revolution on iRacing.com and start slinging mud today.
Introducing a whole new form of racing to the best online racing simulation in the world. This is Dirt Racing on iRacing.com. Race online at some of America's most legendary dirt tracks, including Eldora and Williams Grove. iRacing is the premier online racing game featuring NASCAR, IndyCar, sports cars, and now World of Outlaws, the leading sanctioning body for dirt racing iRacing is easy to use and features a centralized ranking system to make sure you have the best experience at any skill level. With a massive inventory of high precision laser scan tracks and cars with an unmatched dedication to quality and detail, iRacing gives you the most authentic online racing experience available. Thanks to iRacing's dynamic track system developed specifically for dirt racing, tracks change over the course of a race, just like your favorite dirt track on a Friday or Saturday night. From a slick racing group all the way up to the cushion, iRacing's dirt tracks deliver non-stop racing action. Partnered with the World of Outlaws, iRacing is your source for the most authentic dirt racing experience available, featuring four brand new tracks and 11 new cars, including street stocks, legends cars, late models, NASCAR trucks, winged and non-winged sprint cars, with much more on the way. Join the dirt revolution on iRacing.com and start slinging mud today. Myrtle Beach, home of the Myrtle Beach Simulation Series on LSR TV every other Wednesday night. That's when you can catch that and as I get beamed in the head by my uh, race director for plugging something other than something that on Race Spot TV. Welcome back to the 60 Plus Racing Adventures right here on Race Spot TV and iRacing Live. Cisco Scarmoose and Jake Sperry here to bring you all the action and well, we cleaned off the track, repaved the track, everything's back to normal here at Road America, here in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. And well, it's time to break out the cheese for race number two because Jake, we got another 14 lapper, another race here in the Pro Masters to see who can tame Road America. Certainly is, and well, it will be another 14 lap adventure. And if that first adventure was anything to go by here, you have to feel that it's all about qualifying position and making sure that you keep the vehicle on the straight and narrow, on the island as it were, as qualifying still going through. Drivers like Richard Coulomb making their run here towards Canada Corner. And for drivers like Coulomb, who were up there but had issues through that first race, this second race, they can't afford any mistakes. No, they cannot. And I think for those guys who had mistakes happen to them, Guys like Donald Stroud and Steven Karkner, those are the guys we're gonna be looking for in this second race. Steven Karkner already on top of the board here in qualifying here, top time of two minutes, three seconds, point seven. So a great run by the number six and behind him, Mark Robertson. See the time start to roll in here. Donald Stroud, meanwhile, gonna go to the top, tap fast time for the number eight. He's got a 203.75, so only three hundredths off. 
it's how close those top two are right now. And on a road course that's four miles long, going by the hundredths is pretty cool to see. Yeah, going by the hundredths, really, really close and well. To see those drivers there, Strout and Karkner, who were up there scrapping so hard in that first race, but both of them running into their own issues. It's nice to see them both having a very good run. Strout is the second driver on circuit in comparison to Karkner. So for Karkner, it's going to be a case of he can get his lap time in first. For the driver of Donald Strout, you'll be able to see what he is looking to target. Karkner has only got to find a few hundreds, 31 of them to be precise. But now, Karkner's run, it seems that here as he heads through the kettle bottoms to Canada corner, Bill Mitchell Ben and turn 14. This is looking like a pretty good lap to me, Cisco. Absolutely, and Stephen Karkner. 13 and then one more corner before he heads to the straightaway but we want to remind you that the 60 plus racing adventures is brought to you by the friends and patrons of the league at Re team racers for christ team championship prizes provided personally by the series administrator in support for all the work by the chaplains of team rfc the real world side of motorsports so thank you to Team RFC and all everyone behind the scenes here for getting those prizes out to the team championship as well as the championship for the drivers themselves. Prizes going out for that as well. So really cool deal here. A lot of great stories for the drivers on the grid here. That lap that Gardner put down was not able to kind of change the uh, the makeup of the leaderboard for the moment. So Strong continues to lead it right now and he's on a cool cool down lap at this point. Maybe trying to see if he can put down another one, but. A lot of stories on this grid here, Jake. A lot of guys ro road raced way back in the day, whether it was SCCA or if it was Winston Cup. But a lot of a lot of experience here. Maybe not necessarily on the sim, but as far as the real life side of things, a lot of great stories. A lot of great stories indeed. It's so nice to see what the older generation has, and those generation stories hopefully will live on long in the memory as the time's coming. Donald Strout is safe. Kenneth Dummer just across the line uh, goes 15th on a 205.663. Donald Strout will cruise over the line, not need to do his time. Wayne Galloway, though, still out on the lap, as is Jose Carlos. Campadonico right now here in the 44. It's Wayne Galloway who's on his final lap and not long to make it happen. Yes, Vanderven hopping, I believe, into the stands here to watch this race. The top three, of course, not allowed to race in race number two, so they're just going to be spectators here. So Antonio Reyes, you will not see him on the grid as far as driving is concerned. So he's going to be out in the stands watching this. So we'll say hello to him if we get a chance. But for the most part, Capodonico now coming through towards Canada Corner. He's going to have 13, 14 left. So a decent lap going for that driver of the 44 right now. He's one of the last guys we have to see to take time here. He certainly is. And well, after him, there's no one else except maybe Franz Brick, who can really get himself round. But there's a minute and a half left to set a lap time through. Bill Mitchell Bend goes Campadonico right now. That was a very nice corner there. Wasn't too aggressive on either side, but he misses the apex by a country mile and a half there through the final corner. Run up to the line. It's not looking uh, too impressive. He'll be happy with himself in and around the top 10. Campadonico then to the line and he will do himself a 207.2. That is not a quick lap time. It's a banker. And Franz Brink decided to pull it behind the wall after kind of halfway through his lap. So he's done. I think that's going to that's going to set the order for these guys and who's going to start where. So now we just got to wait for that time to tick past and uh, twiddle our thumbs a little bit here, Jake. Yeah, we got to twiddle our thumbs just a little bit because, well, it seems that everyone else is done. Camp Donico won't get around to do his other lap, but Donald Strout, a great first lap, and he's on pole position. What a great, great result for him. Great result for him and Steven Kartner getting redemption after g rolling the car in race number one. He's going to have to use this time sparingly to make sure the second race goes well, that he can keep up in those championship standings because Andrew Fiddler, who he was tied with going into tonight, is going to have to make sure to get as many points as he can. He's not going to pass Fiddler, but he's got to keep in close contention here because a couple races still left to go in this season, not here on Race Spont TV, but for the league itself. Richmond, they're heading to the second oval this season for those guys. They went to IRP beforehand, now just Richmond. Then they're going to Spa, and then they're going to Sebring, running the endurance, 
or the GP layout for that track and to keep up with this series when they're not on Racebot TV, find them on the forums for sure. They're easy to find there and standout league for those guys. But time has ticked past, so let's take a look at our starting grid for race number two on the day. Donald Strout took that pull time with the time of two minutes, three seconds, 0.754. Steven Karkner gonna start to driver's left of the number eight with the 203.785. Mark Robertson gonna start third, fourth gonna go to Joe Wren. John Morgan gonna start fifth, and Bruce Poole, after having incidents in the first race, is gonna start sixth. Remigio De Pasqua will start P7, John Martin in eighth. Paolo Bonacera start ninth with a great qualifying time for Jim Oliver, rounding out the top 10. Gerard Florison maybe down the order a bit in 11th. It's Marcel Gutierrez who rounds out 12th. 13th gonna go to Richard Coulomb there who did not have the race he wanted, but it was up there towards the end of it, hoping to have a little more luck. Ronald McManus right behind him, sitting in that 14th position. Kenneth Doomer is gonna finish, start 15th rather. Uh, Dave Killens there gonna start 16th. 17th gonna go to Jose Carlos Campolonico. And Wayne Galloway gonna start in 18th. And then I'll actually round out the grid. Antonio Reyes, Andrew Fiddler, and Franz Brink. I believe Brink will start at the rear of the grid, so he'll be 19th, but the other two not allowed to be on the grid here, so that is your race two field. It certainly is, and what a fantastic field it is to be putting themselves out through. Donald Strout proved himself very well with damage in the opening race. Now with a clean vehicle, he will be a very scary prospect, but he's got to deal with Karkner, who was very aggressive in the opening laps and aggressive in his overtake, such to the aggressiveness he actually crashed out, and he needs these backup points here today because those championship points are going further and further away from him and more towards Fiddler. Yeah, they are. So he's going to make sure he's going to stop the bleeding now and maybe try and grab that that uh, hopefully on the podium spot, maybe even a win for the eight to keep him in this contention for this points battle. We'll talk about it again. We'll see if we can get it up on your screen here. Donald Strout was only one point off Stephen Karkner and Andrew Fiddler coming into tonight. Fiddler, of course, was on the podium in that first race, so he stands to gain the most points out of today. Karkner and Strout battling out to see who will be ahead on that second race in terms of where they're going to sit on the points. And then it's kind of a bit of a gap back to John Morgan, Mark Robertson. Robertson peaking very well now. Robertson actually in a points battle with Bruce Poole, so that's something to keep an eye on. And Antonio Reyes, who doesn't look like he's been in the series for as long as some of the other guys, but he's been tearing it up already ninth in points, so a great job by that driver and another guy in the stands for this race. But, well... Ran towards turn five at this point, Jake, and now this, the question is, these guys got to start warming up their tires, start setting out where those apexes, where my braking lines are going to be, then start figuring out where those gear shifts are, and then next thing you know, we're crossing turn 14, we're back in the green flag. Yeah, we certainly are, and I think one of the issues in qualifying that we saw here in this second bout of qualifying today, Cisco, was the fact of the matter of this lap is so long that the tires actually start going off towards the end of that second lap. As such, we didn't see many improvements like we normally would from drivers going from their first lap to their second lap. So, as Stephen Karkner very aggressively breaks behind the roof safety car, very uh, adamant that he wants it to go a little bit quicker and get himself going. Um... You have to feel that certain drivers here are looking to impress, are looking to try and find themselves those big points that they need in this second race, as it is, quite different from many other series, a chance of redemption. Yeah, it is, and that second race, you know, like we said, for Karkner, for Stroud, who had problems in that first race that had to force them behind the wall, this is their opportunity to go back out there and get themselves some much-needed championship points. It's really going to really going to shake up how the rest of this field is going to go, but I think that that's Paul Smith behind the wheel of the pace car there. I'm not sure. I can't tell from up here in the uh, in the broadcast <laughs> tower. No, I, I can't tell. It's slow. It's uh, deliberate driving. It might be Paul Smith. You never know. But, you know, it's been some fantastic driving that we've seen in that first race. It's all about to happen again for the second race. Same distance, 14 laps, so about half an hour's worth of racing. But the big difference is, this is a chance where you see those drivers middle of the pack who sometimes do get forgotten. This is their time to shine as well. This is great camera footage for them to really go and prove themselves and show to maybe their children, their grandchildren, exactly what they do in their spare time. Also some good camera angles by Paul Smith there. All sorts of different things. We got to see a little bit of suspension. We're looking out the gearbox, at least the feet I'm looking at. I'm a little bit behind you guys. But 
looking out the gearbox, looking around all sorts of sights and sounds here from Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. But as we head through Canada Corner here, just a couple more corners before we can unleash the sound of those pro Mazdas and get back to that green flag racing. Under the Kohler billboard for the final time here, one more corner before these guys. Donald Strout getting down into the gear he wants for this start. The rough RT12R pace car gonna jump to drivers right here. Donald Strout, oh, wait, there it is. He's on the loud pedal now. Flag stand up, they got the green flag out in the air and we're back racing here for race number two from Road America. Very, very good start from Donald Strout. Went instantly and had to. So now Mark Robertson looking to apply the pressure on the driver of Stephen Karkner. Karkner gets a better run through turn number one as it will be the driver of Robertson who backs out of it through the core. It seems that everyone clean for the moment. Two wide but between DePasqua and Martin there. And a big accident at the back. Killen's involved as well. Big, big one there. McManus as well. Three, four vehicles involved. Big one, Cisco. Yeah, that was Doomer was in that as well. It looks like it was a little late. We'll get a replay up on screen to figure out what exactly happened there because that was a massive pileup. And it looks like Doomer just kind of late broke, got into the rear end of what looks like the Ronald McManus machine. They all just piled in from there. Dave Killens there just along for the ride almost at that point. He kind of had a decent line going in there. They just checked up in front of him. Nothing he could have done. So three cars out already. Big incident to start us off here at Road America. Yeah, certainly is big instant. Get, uh, get a replay of that one after the first lap is completed. Battle between Joe Wren and John Morgan. P4, P5 out on circuit. It's a two-car breakaway, as we thought it would be ever so slightly. But a little bit touchy there was uh, Joe Wren through that corner before the carousel. The incident there that we've seen at that corner, heading that 90 degree left, so understated, but it's caught out two people already during this race. And Joe Wren very nearly became another person who was caught out by turn nine. Um, that number to eight turn, I do believe it was, there on the left-hander. Yeah, and Morgan going to have to close in that gap a little bit. Meanwhile, battle for the lead. Donald Strout to driver's left, and Stephen Karkner to driver's right. Aggressive in goes the number 75. Aggressive does not go around that time because Stephen Karkner just made that pass for the lead. So to the lead, once again, goes that number 75. Yeah, fantastic work there from Kark. They're using all of the track and a little bit more. Strout goes in deep and they touch. Around goes Strout and we thought they'd have a good run, but no, he doesn't. He clips the wall in the intersection and that could be the end of Donald Strout yet again. What a shame it was. He was P2 at this time to try and make that happen, but a big, big moment side by side for the lead as well. Replay on screen. Yeah, and we'll take a second look at it. And Stroud kind of fired it in there in the final corner. I don't think he was expecting the 75 to clamp back down on the apex, but that's exactly what he did. And Donald Stroud pounded that wall there at the ending, basically putting the nail in the coffin in the eight car. Not at all what he needed for this championship, and that could very well take him out of maybe trying to get on that podium for it. So Donald Stroud, frustration here at Road America. Mark Robertson now has the lead of this race. John Morgan now looking at position number three. Joe Wren on the outside, trying to hold the outside parabola. He's stuck a little bit with Karkner in front. Uh, Morgan maybe could have dived down a little bit further using his man on the right-hand side as his marker, but he gets the move, but more crucially, loses a lot of time compared to Karkner. That gap already eight tenths of a second between the pair of them and the replay of the start and that big incident with McManus. Yeah, and that one just... Uh, Doomer just came over the radio and just said it was a total misjudgment by him. So, Doomer taking the uh, the uh, the cause for that one there, and uh, OK coming over the radio from McManus. So, those two have worked it out there. You have to feel though for Killen, so he was another innocent driver just caught up in that. So he's still on track, but just wrong place, wrong time for that driver, the number 67. But we're back to the live picture here. The live picture showing us Mark Robertson pulling away right now. Karkner does have some rear wing damage after that contact he made with Donald Stroud, and that could hurt that 75 a little bit, or if it's like Andrew Fiddler, if he can drive that line correctly, he might just be okay. He might just be okay, and you felt with a clean vehicle that Karkner could have pulled away. He can't, and you could even see it there through Bill Mitchell. Ben couldn't get himself onto the curbing on the right hand, on the left hand side, even so he was now tracking out a little bit further. Same again 
could be said, but he gets a very good run there coming out of turn 14, drive up to the line, and he's staying behind, not out of choice, but out of sheer damage itself because he is trying to close that down. Robertson may decide to go defensive into turn one, but in fact, now Karkner is hanging back to try and go through. John Morgan now onto the back of this two-car train to make it a three-car train side-by-side -side for fourth. Bruce Poole down to the inside. Where did he come from? Yeah, he's trying to make up for that wreck that he had in race number one, trying to get every point he had. And Joe Wren right now trying to get past that car, wasn't able to make it happen. So the 57 back up into that fourth place position. The 006, meanwhile, running fifth. And those guys are going to look like they're going to try and battle it out as they head into turn five. But meanwhile, in front of them, Kirkner trying to look, but he just doesn't have the slipstream. No, he doesn't, and that's a big, big problem for Karkner when you have massive straights like these and you're unable to use them to the best of your potential. He may be trying to wait for a better opportunity, the Van der Ven approach, but the Van der Ven approach, as we know here today, Cisco, does not always yield the best results. No, it does not, and for Karkner, I'm not really sure where he's going to be able to get that cutback to having as much speed. The only place I can think of is maybe the front straightaway if you try something drastic. But that damage is having a clear effect on that number 75. He might just be stuck to ride, in, ride behind someone all race. Because I don't know if he has enough speed or aerodynamics on his own to be able to do anything needs a little bit of help but looking a little bit further back Gerard Florison gets a very good run here coming out of the carousel towards Marcel Gutierrez of the six seven eight and well now the run through the kink and that run here towards Canada Corner maybe in Gutierrez's favor no change then it seems into Canada Corner for your leaders but for Gutierrez I think he has a good opportunity here uh well Florison should have a good opportunity doesn't quite have enough to make that move and that just allows Jim Oliver behind to close up onto the rear. Yeah, Oliver closing back up on that battle between Fullerison and Gutierrez there. Meanwhile, one car heading to pit road, it's Bruce Poole. I K maybe damage, maybe he's jumped the start, just gonna take a look at his vehicle. It's all clean, so it would be a penalty, you'd think. Maybe he overtake on the overtook on the wrong side because it is technically here, Cisco. NASCAR rules off of a pace car start. Yeah, it is, and that's just odd. I'm not really sure what that was for, but I guess we'll get it clear from the stewards. Probably once the race is over, he'll come over the radio and tell us. So Bruce Bull to pit road, and what was looking like a great run and a great redemption for that Bruce Bull machine, not going to happen now. He's basically out of this thing at this point he's so far back well, look at john morgan oh my word he was very very aggressive to the inside of karkner and karkner has nothing for him tries to hold it around the outside sorry for cutting you off there cisco but the move doesn't happen but it was a very aggressive turn to the inside for john morgan and now it's allowed joe wren back in yeah it has and joe wren closing up that gap he's looking for redemption as well especially after that last lap he went from seventh on the grid i think at the start of that lap to tenth so Ren trying to get everything he can right now sitting in fourth and uh, Bruce Bull has pulled it behind the wall. So game over for Bruce Bull. Not sure what happened. Also, Paulo Bonsera looks like problems for that driver as well. He came over the radio and uh, not really sure what happened to that driver. I might have to go figure that one out. Yeah, you may do, but at the front of the field, it's two battles, one and two, three and four. Karkner tucked in right underneath the best opportunity that he's had for a very long while. But again, he backs out of it now as the drivers of Morgan and Wren cancel each other out with the toe on the brakes into Canada Corner. One, two, three, four. And don't count out the pass square in position number five. He can very silently make a move when you least expect it. So maybe the pass with an opportunity. Nine laps to go when they cross the start finish line. Mark Robertson, who has been leading effectively since lap two of this event has a great opportunity now to try and hold off the battles behind because of the fact Karkner's got that damage and again he moves to the right hand side to avoid the draft. Yeah he does and he's really only hurting himself by doing that just to note Bona, Sarah and Doomer their very interesting incident we won't get a second look at it but that's going to be something the stewards are going to have to look at because Bonacera basically charged the corner and took out Doomer. So the stewards are going to have to take a look at that. So we'll figure out what that happens. Stay tuned to the forums for that one to see how that sorts out. But either way, this battle for the lead continues. And Karkner really just kind of, he, he's in a position where he's just stuck kind of based on everyone else. He can't really drive his own race. He's kind of fallen into the, I just have to ride behind someone to get a draft.
Yeah, he certainly does. And Morgan is harrying him through every single corner. Late on the breaks from Karkner. Forces out Morgan wide, who misses his point. And Ren had a half chance, but that won't work as now. The driver in fifth, having a look of De Pasqua, has the ability to just, you know, poke a nose around a little bit. Maybe try and find himself just that half a gap, that half a chance to make a move. Because half a chance is sometimes all you get in racing. Mark Robertson, though, still holding that train here with this front five that's going on. But I'm just noticing something right now, and that's Robertson is very, very tight on his lines. He doesn't really extend the track too much. That is hurting him overall by that one mile an hour every time he goes through certain corners. Yeah, and I have to think this the draft is starting to bring a fifth car into play now with Remigio de Pasqua because he's kind of closing in on Joe Ren now. He was in that fourth position, but now closing up. So it's going to be a five-car battle for this lead nose to tail here as they head into Canada Corner. And everybody's going to stay on single file. And DePasco continuing to close. And if these guys don't make moves, it's going to allow, or if they, even if they do make moves, they'll punch such a big hole in the draft that DePasco is going to be there. DePasco has to be there right now as there's a small, small smidgen of a mistake from the driver of John Morgan through that final corner. Great run for Karkner though, who may have the opportunity to go to the front. He's tucked right underneath, he backs out of it. So he's waiting for the last lap to make that move. And now that just brings back John Morgan into play. Joe Wren will now try and close in up as now Remigio, well, let's even get some words out. Remigio de Pasqua now just hanging on to the coattails in position number five. Robertson has this lead, but this is all tactics here that we're looking at from Karkner, even with the damage. And the question is, do you wait until that final lap or do you have, do you want to make that move soon? Because I don't think Karkner is going to want to be leading for very long. But the problem is, if he waits to make that move, and that John Morgan's going to make that move for him and try and pass him. And if Karkner falls back to third or fourth, I don't know if he has the car to get up front. I don't think he does, but Coulomb down to the inside of Joel Martin down at turn number five. That is for position number six, and Coulomb got the fastest lap of the race last time by, by just mere fractions of a second. So Coulomb certainly has the pace to close down all these drivers at the front who are running around about the low 204s here, low to mid 204s. That's going to be a very difficult catch with around four tenths a lap if he can keep that pace. He's only two seconds, though, off of the back of the Pasqua right right now so that's going to be the big beneficiary right now look how far Karkner tracks out wide due to that rear wing damage he is struggling yeah, and Coulomb's gonna have to charge up to this field here if he hopes to make any sort of moves and uh, the first guy he's gonna see is Romigio de Pasqua as they run right now and de Pasqua is still closing but he's still in this very much so is John Morgan gonna look to drivers right there it is and I was waiting to see if we were going to happen. Karkner fires it into Canada Corner. Morgan had to get in the dirt a little bit there and backed off, and that's going to check up Ren. And hello, Remigio de Pasqua. He's in this battle now. Yeah, he is in this battle, and it is a train of five. So it's all down to who makes a mistake and who can cut their way through this field for de Pasqua. He's got to start making moves because half distance will be scored complete at the end of this lap. Here's they go to start lap seven of the event so now here comes the driver again of what is going to be Stephen Karkner he goes to the inside here but the defensive line taken this time so maybe he's looking a bit more aggressive now he got four drivers split by maybe half a second six tenths of a second now as Wren looks to follow nose to tail as well and it's close from Joe Wren I think there was a little bit of contact between him and Morgan and now he drops massively back off of it here comes the driver De Pasqua oh, he and touch oh yes they do there's a block they do touch and De Pasqua firmly told no. Wow, okay, that I, I'm not used to seeing that with cars without fenders, but that looked that looked starkly similar to an ass car move. That was a flat out block right there. We'll see if we can get a replay on that one. But what happened was Ren kind of got a little bit loose, but no, he just moved over. So the, they'll have to look at the driver's code on that one. But that looked very firmly like a block right there. Yeah, you've got to leave one car's width, especially with an overlap like there was between De Pasqua and Ren. That was very, very naughty from Joe Ren, and he will be very lucky to get out of here with his cotton socks. But still, though, this train of five continue in, and all that's done for De Pasqua, it's angered the number four machine coming home uh, from Club Italy, and we know how the Italians are with their flair. If they do get a little bit upset, the Red Mist normally and traditionally does descend here, Cisco. 
don't think DePasqua is terribly happy with Bren after that move. And John Morgan right now all over the back bumper of Karkner. And I think Morgan's just starting to get agitated at this point. He knows he's faster, but he can't do anything about it. So for John Morgan, he's got to hope that I think he's going to make that pass now because the longer he sits back here wasting his tires, trying to get by Karkner, not being able to make it work and run right back on the back bumper of the 177, you can see the accordion effect happening, Jake, and it's behind that driver, Stephen Karkner. It certainly is, and Morgan gets a good run up the hill then on the drive to the start-finish line. Half distance now, officially score complete, down to the inside, and this might be decisive here from John Morgan, and the captain gets himself up then into second position in command, looking at the helm, thinking, I've got a chance at P1, and now Ren wants a piece of the action here. Looks at two, has to back out of it, not enough room, down into three. All of this is allowing Robertson to gain that little bit of fresh air, and the draft becomes that little little bit less effective for John Morgan to close that gap down in. And when Ren got checked up behind that battle, it allowed DePasqua right back into this battle here. So we're going to have two battles. Karkner trying to close in on John Morgan. He's not going to have enough, enough unless a dive bomb not going to happen. Meanwhile, battle right behind him. DePasqua fires it to the inside. And Joe Ren this time not able to defend DePasqua up to P4. And that's what the Pasqua need is now they follow nose to tail through this section. And well, for Joe Red, he will be annoyed that he's lost himself position number four after being close for the last couple of laps to the back of Morgan. Morgan now to P number two. And Karkner really has nothing to work with in terms of getting himself forward. He needs to make moves and needs to make moves quickly. He gets a stunning run. He gets chalked up though, washed out on the outside, but he manages to just gather it back in again for a better run off the exit. Look at this, they're gonna go side by side to the king. Last time this happened, Karkner ended up on his roof, but he gets himself through. Very, very good heads up driving between the two of them. I was really surprised Karkner wanted to do that again after what happened last time, but this time he was on the inside, made it work. Now to Pasqua, looking for the freight train down to drivers. Inside goes the number four, and that's two for the price of one right there in a couple of corners. John Morgan falling back, goes from third, or goes from second rather, to fourth. Yeah, he certainly does. And well, it seems that the driver, John Morgan, looks a bit fiat right now. And you've got a prancing stallion here in position number three and Romigo de Pasqua, who is making some great, great inroads. But still, one and two, Robertson and Karkner. By that admission, we know that Karkner can make a move on a driver who doesn't have damage two tenths of a second as he may have a look to the inside. He backs out of it, though, because of the fact that he was outside that draft very, very early to make that move as now the Pasqua Pasqua comes into play. Ren runs wide, though, out of turn number one. And the thing you have to remember is Karkner and Robertson are teammates. They're going for that team standings right now. Right now, they're on top of the board. So they're just trying to open up that points gap. So as it sits right now, team number one, control of this race at the moment. But DePasqua probably looking to see if he can split those two up. And he's looking to carry team number four, who's, oh, by the way, right behind him in team standings. He's trying to do everything he can to get up into this battle and break those guys up. Oh, and Ren looking down to the inside of Morgan, and that one is not going to work. Ren locks up the front left, trying to make that happen. He's got to be careful that he doesn't get any form of vibration on that tire. It will make his life a million times harder to go through. And again, very, very aggressive through in towards the hurry downs for Karkner because of the fact that he was using all of his road tax and a little bit more. De Pasqua starting to fall back a bit because Karkner has that ability to follow the driver of Robertson better than the driver De Pasqua. And now Morgan. Morgan might try and come back at it. And this is not what either of those drivers want for the team's championship. They've got to get onto the back of Karkner. Yeah, they do, but DePasqua did go purple last time by, so he is throwing everything he has at that car. Very good kink for him there. He made up a ton of time, and if he can make it work, maybe hang out in that draft out of Canada, might be able to get there sooner rather than later. Meanwhile, John Morgan will lock up a little bit by the four, but he's making time up in handfuls, and he is closing right now. But the good thing for those two teammates in front, they don't have to worry about racing each other too much unless Karkner really wants to go for it. I have to think team order is going to be in play here. Those two are going to run single file unless they really want to. Unless they really want to. And now Morgan's got the opportunity again 
heavy to the right hand side give no draft to the pasqua and now they are working together because you saw robertson move across to the right hand side of the circuit to make sure something happens and then they move back to the left to give the draft back to the pasqua it's nascar blocking you'd feel nascar sharing of the draft which gives no real driver an advantage and now through goes john morgan on the pasqua and now that gap six tenths of a second when they cross the line between them now looking seven tenths eight tenths of a second now as they make this run through we could see the weave happening here today right now cisco because of the fact that draft is so so crucial and john morgan his car looks a little bit more oh, stable spun. oh yeah problems for joe wren again so it looks like the the corner once again and that was i believe he had a spin there earlier on yeah that was 14 where he had that incident before so joe wren whatever it seems that car is not happy he got way too much of the grass and the 006 went right around. So Joe Wren, not the day he wants it all. He just needs to sit there and just bang out some nice and clean laps. And he should be okay. But he loses that battle between John Morgan, Remigio de Pasqua. He's completely fallen out of that. Yes, he's now into position number eight, fighting Gerard Florison right now here for P7 overall as he goes very deep in. But the vehicle looked unsettled through 13, and he suddenly just jumped off of the back. Joe Wren having another big moment. So maybe he was just struggling with the fact that he was running in the draft. Maybe the tires had overheated by the fact that he was running so much inside that draft and that dirty air. And that's what people don't often give credit for. Sometimes it does affect the drivers behind. Sometimes Sometimes it also affects the drivers in front with the draft that happens and it's a very very clear thing that he has struggled with that draft especially towards the rear of that pack yeah he has and john morgan meanwhile trying to do anything he can with that gap i think to pasqua he was running down really fast laps as morgan gets a piece of the grass but de pasqua earlier was doing a lot in quicker laps but i think he burned the good out of his tires so the four starting to fall back john morgan really the only crusader left for the non-team cars for those top three and Morgan trying to do everything he can he does close decently here heading into one and at this point it's consistency and wow he got a lot of time through one well, what a brilliant corner from John Morgan, and that's a very crucial corner because it puts him in the battle with Karkner, and Karkner now will feel that he is a little bit worried about what John Morgan can do behind. De Pasqua starting to fall back a little bit, so Karkner now playing the defense role, playing the Barrichello to the Schumacher, or you could say right now the Bottas to the Hamilton as they now run towards turn number five on the brakes. No move's going to happen as the flame spits out of all of those pro -man their engines and now up the hill towards six and seven and the wrap of the corners that happen and the train now back to a train of three looking to become a train of four but there's three laps to go and they cross the line cisco and if you're john morgan you've got to make moves and you've got to make them fast and i have to say unlike f1 i think john morgan has a real shot against the two teammates because that car when it is hooked up looks a tack looks a tick bit faster than both Karkner and Robertson he just has to make sure he gets his lines right and he'll be good and golden here but the question is John Morgan you got to make your way up there can he do it without the help of a teammate drafting with you and this we'll just have to see his corner entries and his run throughs especially the way he's rolled the corners here has been exceptional by the 177 he just needs a little help on the straightaways and to start sniffing that draft and this might be the place where he does a Canada corner once again very good for him and Karkner while he is drafting with his teammate he keeps getting kind of held up by him yeah, a little bit and he'll feel that Karkner wants a last lap move because of his championship position compared to Robertson he gets very very close to the rear had to take a double take into the corner there because he was very very aggressive on those brakes gets a good run out but now that allows Morgan into play as they now look to switch the beams ever so slightly Morgan bringing his pro Mazda back into play two tenths split all three drivers with three laps to go he thought better of it there down into turn number one maybe to turn five is a little bit better for Morgan but that was an opportunity he couldn't afford to really drop back on a half chance there wasted yeah and that's allowed to pasco to start sniffing the draft and come into this so this might be a four car battle for this lead and that's really the only four guys coulomb has not been able to amp his way up to the front here he's going to be stuck in p5 not real not really able to do anything is that number 18 so this is going to be a battle between coulomb's teammate john morgan the two drivers from team number one and morgan going to jump to the inside and will it stick? It won't. Karkner going to fire it into five. A little bit of lockup, but he's going to hold on to that position for dear life. 
brilliant late breaking. Now DePasqua wants a piece of the pie and he can't really get that. And what pie is it? Well, it seems that the people's pie is not helping DePasqua right now. In towards the hurry downs now comes Morgan and Karkner. And right now for Karkner, he will be satisfied with second position. He may feel that he can get a victory, but would he rob that one from his teammate Robertson, who has been working so hard at the front of the field just to keep a very, very consistent pace? Nothing too special from Robertson, but he has been very, very good at running those lap times. There has been not really much deviation from 2.04.3s, 2.04.2s. In fact, he's doing quicker lap times now that the cadence has been ramped up. Yeah, it has, and DePasco might have something on John Morgan because he had a very good kink. Look to driver's right. The driver from Club Iberia going to look to inside, and he's going to force him off a little bit. They're going to get very close there, but I think DePasco just squeezed it out. The problem is DePasco, by doing that, they lost so much time to the leaders, they may not be able to get back up there. Oh, you Americans and your geography. Club Italy will tell him, but... The Pasqua now losing all that time and with two laps to go, I think they've just made this a two vehicle shootout. Is the gap within one second? The question remains and the answer is when they cross the line, the difference is about 1.4. So that's not good enough for the Pasqua. They've lost the second gap and now it's Karkner versus Robertson and this one for all the cookies. Yeah, I read that one wrong on the timing. My bad there, but either way, the teammates have basically... Karkner's basically like the linebacker to Robertson's running back at this point because Karkner's just done all the defense and Robertson's been able to just sit up front and run his line. So Karkner doing the heavy working here and unless DePasqua gets a huge run this time by, I think he's going to run out of time, Jake. I think he is. Two laps to go. He's got to get past both of them. I don't see that happening. He plays defense, though, down to turn number five. So that's admission. And P5 now, the battle going on. Martin and Coulomb here going together. They touch. And round will go the driver of Joel Martin. He holds it all together. And that was a case of not leaving enough room. And for Joel Martin, he pays the heavier price. Yeah, and Martin got spun all the way around. And Coulomb nearly got him that second time. But... Richard able to drive past him, so those guys have sorted it out for the moment. Meanwhile, battle for that P3 continues because John Morgan tracking down Remigio de Pasqua very close in turn number eight, but turn number nine's and ten, the carousel. De Pasqua has a very good diamond through there, but John Morgan looking to close in here. He's been very good on the kink lately. Let's see if he can get it done through here. Maybe he can, so now through the kettle bottoms and looking for an opportunity in that gap. Slowly closing, but with a lap to go, you don't count anything out at Road America. Anything that can happen and will happen certainly has happened. And well now, John Morgan and Killen's round there towards the back of the field, the 67 machine. So he's done that one through the hurry downs, but at the front of the field with a lap to go, Cisco, you have to feel that if the driver of Stephen Karkner wants the win, he'll go for it. If he wants the win, he'll go for it, but I get the feeling that we're going to see Mercedes tactics here from the final lap. I think these guys will be content to ride unless Karkner is going to look a little bit to driver's right, but I'm not expecting to see a whole lot. Karkner is looking, but he doesn't want to take his teammate on the dive bomb, so I just don't think, I think with that damage, I'm not sure Karkner is going to have the speed to do it, and with DePasqua closing in here, I think Carter has to play defense at this point. I think he does, but DePasqua and Morgan have done some two sensational lap times, 2.032 and 2.036. They've brought themselves back into this fight, but they're not going to have an opportunity, you feel, down in towards turn number five. It will have to be towards the Kettle Bottoms and Canada Corner. Another little look from the driver of Karkner. DePasqua again goes defensive, turns it into an offensive move, gets stuck round the outside. So John Morgan, and thank you very much. He says position three's mine. Now I'll go after Karkner. Yeah, and Karkner at this point, he's loving what he's seen in the mirror, but the problem is it's all right next to him. So he has to make sure he can open up that gap. He does a little bit of very good hurry down section for Stephen Karkner. And Karkner at this point, defense all the way. John Morgan, meanwhile, maximum attack as they head into carousel maximum attack but he's running out of road and has dropped back a little bit too much for Robertson I think he's safe from here it depends on Karkner and what run he can get through this kink and the answer is not going to be very much it's very evenly spread out at about half a second a gap for each so I feel that Robertson's your winner barring a mistake in the final three corners Cisco 
Yep, Canada corner, final time for these guys. Robertson first into the corner on hard. The brakes here into the right-hander. Morgan close that gap, but Karkner, very good exit. John going for everything he can. Morgan trying to close it down, but for Mark Robertson through turns three, 13 and one more, turn 14, and it's all over for Robertson. Morgan, one last shot at it, and I don't think it's gonna be enough, and that means the teammates from team number one, Mark Robertson, gonna bring it home, and Steven Karkner, he's gonna hold on to it. Draft coming into play, but it won't be enough. Team one sweeps top one and two. Oh, what a brilliant, brilliant race we have seen between them, and it was working time and time again, and you feel that the work between Robertson and Karkner, they have played the ultimate team game, and sometimes you need two teammates that know to work together, but for P12, though, out on circuit, it seems that Campodonco uh, and Wayne Galloway here having this nice little scrap towards the line, and if Galloway can get a very good run out of the final corner, we could see a drag race, Cisco. Yeah, Galloway gonna look for the final time. Can he put this away? No, he can't. A very, very sporadic line by the 92, and it's not gonna work. Galloway's gonna have to tap, and Capodonico is gonna hold on to that position. Oh, it just looked like they were trying to psych each other out in the end. Uh, it was after you, sir, no, after you. So Wayne Galloway says, you know what, I'll stay behind, but what a brilliant battle that we've seen there, and what brilliant battling we've had up and down these two races and two fields, because for the most part, even though we've had five retirements from this race, these 14 who finished have certainly put on a really nice show. Yeah, they absolutely have. And uh, race said race administrator Donald Strout saying congrats to John Morgan, the best racing slash sportsman of the day. I think I have to agree with that, Jake. But either way, let's take a look at your full race rundown here for race number two. Mark Robertson and Stephen Karkner, they make it happen from team number one, sweep the top two positions. Then John Morgan, who was amazing driving out there in the 177 finishes third fourth gonna go to Remigio de Pasqua and probably not what he wanted but neither less he had a really good run all day plus three positions for the Italian driver Canada bring Canada's Richard Coulom is gonna finish fifth Joe Wren gonna finish sixth for Club Ohio for the Benelux driver Gerard Florissant gonna finish seventh Jim Oliver eighth ninth gonna go to Marcel Gutierrez and Joe Martin rounds out your top ten Franz Brink with a quiet day, 21st to 11th, plus 10 positions. Then you got likes of uh, Campodonico finishing P12, Galloway unable to make the move on the last corner, P13. Last of the cars and lead lap, Dave Killard. Then you got the vehicles who failed to finish, Ronald McManus, Bruce Poole, Paolo Bonacera, and Donald Strout very early on. Also, don't count out Kenneth Dummer, or Duma, shall I say. He's managed to finish P19, but 13 laps down, not the best of days for him. Up. We've caught up with the driver who makes it happen and the driver who's looking very much like Lewis Hamilton at the end of that, Mark Robertson. You and your teammate, Steven Karkner, pulled on an amazing show and teammates prevailed there. Talk us through it. Well, uh, somebody, they spun in front of me and the race came to me. I, I moved into first place and I just tried to hit my marks stay out of the rear view mirror and uh, make it happen. It's my first, my, it was my first, uh, first win with this league. I want to thank Donald Strout uh, for putting this league together and uh, Bruce Poole for inviting me to join. It was, it was great. Uh, so this is my first time doing this, so, but I had a great time. Yeah. Quick change of the codec there. Just FYI, Paul, but Mark, I mean, you guys in the team standings have done an amazing job. You got 23.8 right now to DePasqua, Campo de Nico, and Reyes' 19.8. As a team, that's got to make you feel good. Everybody doing their job very well in that whole whole group of team number one. Yeah, I've got uh, three great teammates. Uh, Bill, who couldn't make this race, and uh, Steve. They're both fantastic, and Andy, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but, uh, I mean, I can't say enough about these guys, and I can't say enough about this league. Well, this is the last time we're going to be seeing you guys. Still three races to go. The Oval at Richmond, first up on the list. Your second Oval that you guys have run this season. How are you feeling heading towards the racetrack in what used to be the Richmond Fairgrounds? Well, I'm feeling pretty good. I uh, actually got a second in the uh, first race at uh, at the IRP, and uh, so it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the oval.
Well, Mark, I know you don't get it done by yourself. Sponsored shoutouts. Anyone else you forgot to mention here that you want to give a call to? Just my wife, Sharon, and my grandson, Jaden, that uh, allow me to take the time to do this. Thank you. All right, well, that's Mark Robertson. Brings it home. Top step of the podium and the first step of the podium for the two guys from team number one. Mark, congratulations, and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you, guys, and I appreciate y'all hosting. Very nice. Thanks. Well, Jake, we got to talk to Mark Robertson at least, but that's going to do it here for our coverage of the series. Still three races to go for these guys. They're looking forward to going to the Oval at Richmond. That's going to be a whole lot of fun, but for us here in the broadcasting side of it, that's, well, we're throwing the checkered flag on that one, unfortunately for us. Yeah, it is a shame because we saw some brilliant action here, but I do believe that we're going to have one more race uh, for their end of the season, if memory serves me correctly. But uh, for my time here in this booth, it was very nice to see. And hopefully uh, Jack Styles will be able to see exactly uh, the same sort of action that we had here today. We'll see what we can fry up for the end of the season. But either way, we do want to thank everyone behind the scenes at 60, 60 Plus Racing Adventures, Donald Strout, everybody behind the scenes there, Team Racers for Christ, as well as everybody here at Race Spot TV and tonight's broadcast. For Paul Smith behind the scene on the cameras, for Jake Sperry, and of course, Will Vincent and Hugo Luis at Race Spot TV. My name is Cisco Scaramuz, and alongside me, Jake Sperry, hey, I guess we'll see him at VLN this weekend. Certainly will. Good night, everybody. <laughs>